Yeah, thanks very much uh, for having our paper on this uh, great program. Uh, so this is joint work uh, with Colin Keynes uh, from UBC and uh, Yogi Kamburov uh, from uh, uh, U of T. And this um, paper differs in two aspects from what we have seen so far today. The first one, uh, the first difference is uh, there's absolutely no model in it. It's purely data driven. Uh, but we think that the facts we're documenting are interesting enough to stand on, uh, on their own. Uh, and second, uh, there's no human capital in it either. We're actually talking about skills, but I think our findings um, uh, raise interesting questions about how to model uh, human capital in the future. Uh, so um, the, uh, the project uh, was um, motivated uh, by essentially a couple of figures um, uh, that are not our own, but uh, that are taken from a, a recent paper by David Otter and David Dorn that came out in, uh, in uh, the AR and got a lot of attention, not only acad in academic circles, but also in, uh, in newspapers. Um, and uh, so these figures are about uh, chop polarization and the importance of uh, routine versus non-routine chops, in particular non-routine low-skill service chops. And so what's being done here is um, occupations uh, on a three-digit level are ranked uh, by their uh, 1980 um, log hourly uh, wage. Uh, and then um, uh, uh, um, one plots employment growth and uh, wage growth between 1980 and 2005 uh, against uh, this measure of skills. So actually Otter and Dorn and others in the literature really interpret uh, this 1980 um, wages as some kind of measure of skills. And so what comes out of this is uh, the well-documented job market polarization, uh, in particular uh, the jobs that have um, uh, fair diverse in terms of employment growth and uh, wage growth are the ones that are traditionally uh, middle wage jobs or middle class jobs or middle skill jobs. Uh, and uh, of course the ones that have got uh, experienced the largest wage gains and employment gains are high skill jobs. So that's basically uh, can be explained by skill bias technological change. But somewhat surprisingly uh, another group that has gained in terms of uh, wages and, and employment are um, low skill jobs. And um, uh, those are um, predominantly low skill service jobs. Uh, now, the interpretation of this order um, is um, uh, that um, middle class jobs, well, that's what Otter and Dorn and David Otter uh, has shown in a sequence of peer, uh, uh, papers, that uh, these traditionally middle class jobs are uh, routine jobs that uh, are easily uh, computerized. So the technological revolution over the last three decades uh, has basically um, uh, sh um, made workers with comparative advantages in this medium um, skill jobs uh, much worse off. But at the same time, low skill service jobs cannot be computerized as easily. They are non-routine, that's how it, um, uh, David Order and uh, um, polarization literature calls them. Uh, and uh, together with an increase in the demand for um, uh, services, actually uh, wages for this group increased. Now, um, uh, what precisely motivated what we're doing in this paper uh, are uh, various issues we have. Uh, this, this, figure. Th this is somewhat controversial, isn't it? I thought there were differences, for example, like male versus female. You look at those differences. And it's been uh, there's some dispute about just how strong this polarization evidence is. Uh, that's right. That's uh, I think that's male, uh, and it's mostly uh, for male, but uh, David Otter. Um, uh, and uh, Katz and Kearney have also a paper where they argue that it's uh, quite robust with respect to um, controlling for education and also controlling for gender. But actually, um, this paper, what, we all, uh, what I will talk about now, is exactly about what you mentioned. Like this relationship is actually not, not strong at all. And uh, so we, we want to offer a reinterpretation of um, the evidence on wage growth by occupations. Uh, so the first issue we have. Um, is how should we actually uh, interpret uh, these 1980 uh, wage levels or uh, why should we believe that they are a good measure of skills? After all, uh, all wage levels can, can reflect a lot of uh, different things rather than skills like compensating wage differentials uh, or um, institutional frictions like unionization. So unionization rates in, in routine jobs actually were quite high in 1980. 
Um, and uh, uh, to show you what precisely we have in mind with, with this uh, comment, um, I want to give you a few examples. And uh, basically, um, these examples are selected in such a way that they already hint at where we are going to and uh, how we differ uh, in thinking about occupations from um, uh, the polarization literature. Uh, so let's fix um, uh, the 1900 wage level at approximately the um, uh, the median, so this is around here, and let's look at, well, these are kernels, right, so they are actually smooth, uh, they are local averages uh, over uh, a lot of occupation uh, cells. Uh, so now look at, uh, let's look at the actual occupations we find uh, here in this bin at the 50th percentile. So we have, for example, uh, drilling machine operators, they had a wage growth of 0% between 1980 and 2005. Uh, but in the same bin, we actually also have occupational therapists, which had a wage growth of 59%. Uh, so this is hidden by the kernel. So uh, uh, we have quite a bit of variation in wage growth, uh, even within this, um, uh, within this bin. Uh, another group that is interesting is we have truck drivers at 4% versus auto mechanics uh, that had a wage growth of 19%. And uh, what, what comes out of this intuitively, uh, how we think of this is that drilling machine operators and truck drivers seem to be very simple occupations. Uh, they seem to really draw from um, uh, low skill um, uh, the uh, labor supply of the low-skill um, uh, low workers, uh, while occupational therapists and auto mechanics seem to already involve some kinds of, of uh, task complexity. Uh, though, so that's essentially how we are thinking about uh, these differences. Um, now we can also do the same thing at uh, another bin. So let's do it at uh, the 25th uh, um, uh, uh, percentile of the 1980 wage distribution. Again, let's look at the entire occupations we get there. So we have. Uh, for example, a janitor who had a wage growth of 10% versus a licensed nurse who had a wage growth of 48%. Uh, taxi drivers had a wage growth of 11% versus a dental assistant, uh, which had a wage growth of 46%. And again, it seems to us intuitively, though later we actually um, uh, measure this more precisely, that uh, there is something different about licensed nurses and dental assistants from janitors and taxi drivers, even though in 1980 they were actually uh, at the same point in a, um, uh, in a skill distribution, or what uh, um, a lot of people think is, is a distribution of skills. So, excuse me, did you, you said this was for men? Are you for um, no, actually, sorry, this is, no, actually these means here are aggregated over everybody. So, yeah, yeah, no, no, no you're, you're right, yeah, this is uh, aggregated over everybody, sorry, yeah. Uh, so now we're cutting, uh, so the second issue, um, uh, we are concerned about uh, is um, whether we can really think of low skill service jobs and routine jobs as, as segmented markets, because that's essentially what's behind um, this uh, task approach in, or this non-routine versus routine approach at interpreting uh, job polarization. Uh, so is it really true that uh, low skill service jobs uh, draw from a different labor supply than uh, routine occupations uh, so that actually um, wage growth and employment, uh, wage growth in uh, low skill service jobs occupations are decoupled from wage growth uh, in routine occupations. And so now, so, so now we are cutting the data, um, or we are cutting this figure here a bit differently. Before I fixed the, the wage level in 1980 and looked at the different occupations, now we are uh, basically fixing the wage growth and uh, we are comparing uh, n uh, what Otto and Dawn call non-routine service uh, occupations with what Otto and Dawn call uh, routine occupations that are in the middle of the skill distribution. And so what we have here is uh, precision makers, um, they are uh, uh, labeled as routine jobs. Uh, they were in the middle of the skill distribution, uh, in the middle of the 1980 wage distribution. They had wage growth of 30%. Uh, versus a library assistant, this is a, a deemed a low skill non-routine service occupation, was in the lower third of the um, um, 1980 uh, wage distribution, had a wage growth of 27%. Uh, um, other examples are here, legal assistants and paralegals are also deemed routine uh, in the Otter and Dorn um, analysis, is also in the middle of this uh, graph. Uh, child care workers had actually the very lowest uh, 1980 log wage. Uh, they also had 24% wage growth. Now, 
So these are high wage growth occupations, uh, routine versus low skill non-routine service occupations. Now let's do exactly the same, but uh, we are uh, looking at low wage growth of, of uh, occupations. And so here we are having something like mixing blending machine operators with wage growth of just 7%. That's a routine occupation uh, versus food preparation. That's a, a non-routine service occupation with a wage growth of 6%. Even more extreme, uh, we have shipping and receiving clerks, again, routine uh, had wage losses or real wage losses versus ushers uh, also had real wage uh, losses. And now if you're uh, uh, comparing the low wage growth with the high wage growth occupations here, um, it doesn't seem that routine versus low skill matters that much for wage growth, uh, but there is something inherently different about, uh, um, about these four uh, occupations uh, up here from, from the four occupations down here. And later we will argue that um, these uh, occupations up here uh, involve some type of complex skills. Um, and uh, these occupations down here uh, are what we call simple occupations. So those are occupations where you basically can um, drop out of high school and, and uh, start right away. Yeah. Does it matter how you define routine? So if you define, so if I recall correctly, they have like three measures, routine, uh, dexterity, and, uh, and something like this more correct. Yeah, right? yeah. So does it matter if you just look at uh, like the one component and like the ranking relative to other, like other jobs, or you look at the relative component for each job and then rank those? Uh, so I will talk about this quite a bit later, actually. So how, um, uh, how do you define, so it's, it's really about how they define routine that drives a lot of the differences we will get later. Uh, and, and I talk about actually exactly that point. Um, so this is just a motivation and now you may think, okay, it's, so those are just a few special cases, but also coming back to um, uh, uh, um, Jim's question, actually we should not just look at the kernel, we should look at the raw data to actually see um, uh, if this kernel is that informative. Uh, and actually, it's not all that informative. So now you actually wonder, well, this looks quite different than the kernel that I looked, uh, showed you before. And this is because here I showed you the raw data. So this is actually for um, on, on the three-digit occupational level, um, while um, Arch and Dorns uh, aggregate them up into 100 bins. And so this uh, aggregation of uh, um, these 300 and something occupations into 100 um, uh, groups uh, uh, squishes the graph together and gives you uh, a more pronounced kernel, polarization kernel, but um, uh, um, we can actually reproduce their um, figures when it comes to wage growth perfectly. Uh, reproducing uh, the kernel for employment growth was more problematic. But in any case, so what we see here is the variation is huge. Like uh, actually these kernels are not precise at all. Uh, so um, yes, uh, here at the lower end of the skill distribution, there seems to be a bit of a higher mass up there on the hi uh, high wage growth occupations. And it seems that in the middle, there are indeed more outliers uh, uh, at the bottom. But overall, no matter where we look at, there are just really everywhere high wage growth and low wage growth occupations. And if you actually smooth those out using kernels, we really lose all of this uh, information. Actually, we would uh, uh, already see this if they get, so I mean, this, uh, the blue line is the kernel. Um, if you uh, gave some kind of confidence interval or just a measure of precision around that, you would already see that um, actually this kernel does not in, uh, involve that much uh, information. Um, so uh, we think that um, we should uh, uh, take every um, of these dots seriously. Um, uh, beca well, I mean, if you run regressions uh, on individual level data, <sighs> Most of the time, our data are quite noisy, right? But you need to keep in mind, these are data that already are already highly aggregated. Every dot in this figure is already highly aggregated. Some of these dots involve aggregation of 10,000s of data points, right? Each dot repre represents one occupation. So these deviations from the trend line should not just be treated as measurement error or some uh, characteristics that are outside of uh, the model world, these deviations uh, should be treated as something informative. And so we view the residuals as something highly informative uh, and we want to figure out is, uh, if there is something systematic about the occupations that are, that are above or below the kernels. And when I gave you the figures earlier, um, uh, they should have highlighted already at where we think 
um, these occupations differ. We think that the, the occupations above the kernel are uh, occupations involve some kinds of task complexity and the occupations below the kernels are simple occupations that really draw from essentially a huge labor supply. Uh, and uh, so to capture this, we deviate from the focus on computerization. Uh, in some sense, we, we think uh, of computerization not as um, uh, something that applies to middle skilled jobs, but um, rather as a symptom for actually a low skilled job, right? Which kind of jobs can be computerized uh, at least between 1980 and 2005? It's most likely jobs that involve um, low skill uh, tasks or um, uh, simple tasks. So we'll develop a new occupational classification um, uh, and uh, our classification will be more directed, directly linked to skill, uh, not necessarily to, to computerization. So in the end, um, um, most of our low skill occupations or most of our what we call simple occupations can be computerized. Um, uh, no, every uh, computerizable occupation uh, is likely to be low skill, but not every low skill occupation can be uh, computerized. But in the end, they draw from the same labor supply, or that's how we think about the world. Uh, and so they will have similar wage growth and employment growth. Just so computerization, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, are you saying, so, so from a statistical point of view, are you saying that you can't reject a hypothesis of a flat line? Uh, essentially, yes, actually, yeah, that's yeah. right. If you uh, uh, treat, um, wouldn't it be I, I show you this later, actually, I show you the regression. Motivation? Wouldn't it be more straightforward to simply say, <coughs> here's the data, we can't reject a flat line? Sure, yeah, that would be a different well, interpretation. Too. <laughs> <laughs> but what's, you can't reject a flat line in just in wages or in? Um, uh, well, actually, in employment either, because actually our, when we try to reproduce the employment uh, kernel, it looks a bit different at the left end. We don't get this steep, in, steep decline. But um, in any case, I show you the regression results later. And actually, um, well, this is on the next slide. Uh, on this slide, with, uh, once we actually treat, yeah. No, just I, I hope you go ahead and answer the question. But just in terms of why, what was the ex what's the definition of computerization? Why is it? You're saying it somehow substitutes directly? So there's a very special notion of the technology. I can see it going either way, you know, complements. And even if it kind of is just augmenting, it would depend on the elasticity of demand, or in final demand or immediate demand, for that particular service that's being produced. So I'm just not sure when you write down computerization, the idea is that somehow it's a substitute. But I mean, I mean, it, it could actually, more computerization could actually increase the demand for the, that skill, right? Um, uh, so, uh, yes, that's right. So there is I mean, evidence that actually... Somehow there's an inelastic demand for yeah. these services or something? I mean, if I had a highly elastic demand and I enhance these services, I could be gangbusters. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to ask the, in the literature what the assumption is, or do they use, use a model? Um, so... Uh, <laughs> um, routine task input is defined as um, uh, occupations that involve a lot of finger dexterity uh, or that involve adapt adaptability to work requiring set limits, tolerances or standards. So that's uh, the definition of a routine occupation. And uh, the, the assumption is that routine occupations can be uh, uh, computerized. But let me tell you, like, I mean, in what we're doing, we're not talking about computerization at all. But um, uh, so, um, but what you uh, say is exactly right. So computerization itself can change the task um, requirements for an occupation over time, and there is some evidence on that, right? So actually, if a, an occupation becomes uh, more technological, if uh, a computer in uh, an occupation now some uh, is computerized, we need people who are actually able to uh, to use the computers, right? And so there is some evidence on that. But um, actually, uh, this literature really holds um, um, this task measures constant, essentially at their much earlier level, in 1980 or 1990. Um, 
so uh, what we what we find is so once we are not smoothing um, the routinization or computerization index has no strong and robust explanatory, po uh, explanatory power for wage and employment growth. Uh, what we find is our measure of task complexity is strongly related to, to wage and employment growth. Uh, we define complex tasks as essentially uh, uh, tasks like abstraction, analyzing, make uh, so any task that involves abstraction or uh, analysis or making connections, form decisions, or communicate effectively. Uh, and um, uh, our task complexity measure is highly re uh, relevant no matter in um, where in the 1980 wage distribution we measure it, uh, or no matter what, what the routinization index is. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, uh, some people talk about the importance of social skills, and social skills in terms of social skills yeah. going out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question, and um, I think. Yeah, I think um, to the extent how we can measure that, it's really limited by the data, uh, and I would say probably um, it would fall under the communication, the effective communication, and the yeah. Essentially, I think that's how cl how close we can get to that. So uh, um, um, a third question that, that, that came to us when we, uh, when we thought about um, these uh, polarization graphs is what exactly the policy implications are. Right? Uh, if you have an individual, so if you take really the, the 1980 wage as, um, as a serious measure of skills and somebody is, um, say, here at that point in a skill distribution, uh, any skill enhancing policy that's targeting that individual will actually not make the individual better off, right? Um, but in our um, world, uh, or how we are interpreting uh, occupations and how they fare, uh, how they have fared over the last few decades, uh, I think we will have we, have we have very clear policy implication. Any policies that target skills and human capital actually will be um, effective in in promoting uh, labor market out uh, better labor market outcomes. Now, uh, so measuring uh, tasks um, uh, on occupational level is really limited by data availability. And uh, so there's the dot, there's the O-net, and both of them have actually quite uh, a bit of limitations. And so we do something that really looks very strange at, at first. We are actually not using an American data set. We use a German data set. Uh, and um, while that, uh, so the German data set is, um, uh, has advantages over over this American data sets, and so uh, we, we um, yeah, so here are the advantages. First of all, uh, they are worker level data that are collected in repeated cross sections since '79, uh, in intervals of about six to seven years, uh, and um, they uh, so. The dot, for example, uh, asks about task inputs they, they contact ana analysts, not workers. Right? But uh, these data here, the BIP data, are really worker-level data. So you can imagine it's, uh, it has very similar questions like the CPS has or the term census has, but that in addition, they ask the workers exactly about uh, what tasks they're using and which intensity. Uh, so they have a catalog of approximately 20 tasks, and then uh, they need to rank how important uh, that task is on their job. Uh, we are not the first uh, who use that data set. Um, uh, so, um, and and uh, the tasks in there are very well defined, which we like. Uh, while in a dot, as, uh, at least how uh, uh, um, th a lot of the literature has used it, um, the definition of uh, uh, of tasks are a bit weak. Um, also, um, we think that we have a useful validity check for um, our uh, occupational classification. And here, uh, we will be using um, the share of apprentices in uh, particular um, occupations and uh, relate them to uh, our um, uh, uh, task uh, index. So I will talk about this in a moment, exactly what this means and why, this, why it is informative. Uh, so the BIP is a survey data on qualification and working conditions in Germany. It's a repeated cross-section. It's available uh, in 79, 86, and 92. It's also available in uh, 99 and 2006. But uh, there was quite a bit of a survey redesign in, uh, in 99. So, um, and uh, actually, it became less informative. 
so we do not use 99 in two, uh, 2006. Uh, at the same time, we are really looking at the period from uh, 1980 to 2005. So uh, we don't think we lose. Uh, uh, so we think that these years are, are these years here are most representative uh, for the sample period, anyways. Um, and. Uh, so uh, we then follow a paper by Gartman and Schoenberg in the 2010 uh, Shaun of Labor Economics uh, where they uh, uh, sort these uh, 20 tasks into fi uh, um, five um, aggregate tasks. Uh, the first one is manual simple. Uh, this is something like equip machines, pack, ship, transport and archive. Manual complex, uh, cognitive simple, cognitive complex and uh, interactive. Um, and so um, uh, particularly interesting here is the manual complex occupation. This uh, uh, involves manufacturing and processing, uh, but what we're talking here is about uh, really um, uh, uh, producing some kind of good, right? So uh, essentially um, a carpenter uh, would fall under um, manual complex because carpentry involves manufacturing and processing, uh, while um, somebody who just opens up the road, a construction worker who just opens up the road, would just uh, be coded as um, equipping machines, right? And uh, here we are really differing um, quite a bit from uh, um, um, the literature, right? Because in, um, as I showed you before, in the literature, uh, manual routine is defined by uh, finger dexterity, if the occupation involves finger dexterity. Uh, manual uh, non-routine uh, uh, is defined to involve eye-hand food coordination, so this is non-routine manual. Um, it's not really clear to us why eye-hand food coordination is non-routine manual uh, and finger dexter uh, uh, dexterity is routine manual. Um, and uh, here we really... Um, Required for operating the computer to kind of take it down. I mean, you would think this first might be more important than the second, right? I'm mean, just saying, if in terms of my sort of, I'm a, I'm a factory worker, I want to type things in. Yeah. Dexterity would matter a bit. I mean, I don't know. I'm just you probably thought more about this. But I mean, the computer itself is the technology. I'm just asking for that particular skill. Which of those traits are most useful for? Being able to some intelligence, but also some dexterity, right? Uh, dexterity, tools. right? Uh, and um, uh, probably also um, um, some of the uh, routine cognitive, actually. Right. Yeah. So, a more general question: What happens in your analysis if you're making mistakes? Uh, aggregated particular types of jobs into the wrong uh, thing. Are, so probably. Yeah, our measure will not be perfect. That's right. Uh, in some ways, we of course misclassify, uh, misclassify occupations. We run regressions later, and the regressions don't have a perfect fit, right? So. Um, That's right, that's true, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not accusing you, I'm saying it. That would be a, <laughs> that's right, yeah, that would be a possibility. Yeah. You tell us why that might make sense. Yeah, that, that's right. But the, but the data fitting part of that is a statement about earnings or employment. Right. It's not a statement about whether managing should be a cognitive. Like, no, but then you have to think about which composition of skills better matches the wage or the Yeah, so all I can say at this point is, um, okay. so uh, okay. our measures are strongly related to um, wage and employment growth, and they go in the right direction. So, um, but they probably don't maximize fit. We can probably do better by really developing some kind of routine that maximizes the fit. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, 
so to simplify the analysis, we actually found it uh, very uh, helpful to assign uh, the three-digit occupations to one of four islands, uh, which we call simple, uh, complex, advanced, and college occupations. And so uh, now we have um, essentially this um, individual level data that have occupational information and uh, information on tasks. So we can aggregate those individual uh, level data in some way and then um, uh, get occupation level information about task usage and then we want to sort them into these four islands. Um, and so uh, our algorithm, uh, we actually have done a lot of robustness exercise with this, um, but um, uh, so in step one, uh, we are starting with exogenous uh, assignments. Okay, so uh, college occupations are defined by essentially occupational requirements. These are um, uh, occupations that require um, uh, university degrees to be able to uh, practice them. So that includes lawyers, um, uh, surgeons, uh, architects, things like uh, occupations like this. Uh, we also um, then do an exogenous assignment into advanced uh, occupations. Uh, and uh, we do this because um, there are occupations that are very clear upgrades from other three-digit occupations, like for example, advanced technicians, foremen, uh, management of various levels. Uh, so here we already have these two islands, advanced and college, and essentially um, they are very, very strongly related to uh, uh, education, so essentially they really, um, uh, if you look at ac average educational attainment, these are basically all university graduates or college graduates, right? Uh, and as it turns out, um, our um, classification really has the most bite, or differs the most at the lower end and the middle end uh, of uh, these kernels I showed you at the beginning. But at the high end, at the um, upper level occupations, we are actually, uh, we are not really differing from um, Otter and Dorn or uh, the other work in the um, literature. Uh, and then in step two, we do assignments based on task data. And uh, here, this is actually the step where we experimented with different cutoffs and uh, different algorithms, but actually our results, um, or at least our island designations are quite robust. Uh, so we sort um, occupations into island one if um, uh, the reporting fraction or the fraction of those who report that a simple task is important is larger than two thirds. Uh, we sort them in island two if uh, um, uh, uh, the fraction of workers who report that the complex task is important uh, is larger than two thirds. <laughs> and then uh, we also, um, so uh, we still have not, if you use that algorithm, we still have not sorted all of the three digit occupations into one of the islands, so we need to do something more. Uh, we define, uh, we sort uh, uh, three, digit uh, three digit occupations into island two if uh, multiple tasks have a, high, uh, have a high reporting fraction. So, in a sense, uh, if um, uh, uh, if a job requires a lot of different tasks, then we think this is a measure of, of job complexity because you need to do a lot of different things, right? This is almost a definition of a complex job. Uh, and uh, finally, we define island one if the simple tasks, uh, um, uh, actually if um, the share of simple tasks changed a lot over time because that uh, shows that this uh, island has been automated. Um, so, uh, now we have this uh, new classification. Does it make sense? We want to have some validity, uh, validity checks. Uh, we want to see if it really does capture some uh, skill dimension. And so what we do first is we use more German data. And then afterwards, we also use, uh, match them to, to the US data. So, um, so what we do as the first validity check is uh, to um, exploit the fact that Germany operates the largest apprenticeship training program in the world. This is an apprenticeship training program that can be started after a completion of a secondary uh, degree. So, um, and uh, this, uh, this apprenticeship training program is explicitly occupation specific. So um, the Department of Labor has developed well-defined curricula for um, the uh, um, for apprentices programs in, in over 500 occupations um, and uh, each of these curricula um, is a combination of general education so the students go or the apprentices go to public schools for 40% of the time there they learn general skills or general knowledge and 60% of the time uh, they get on the job training off uh, uh, by an employer who is willing to actually hire these apprentices. Uh, it is uh, highly regulated and monitored by various institutions, uh, for example, Chambers of Industry and Commerce and the, and the Ministry of Labor. Uh, and uh, what is well documented is that uh, there's a significant opportunity cost uh, uh, to an apprenticeship uh, um, uh, training. Um, first of all, um, 
So each, if, if you have uh, completed a secondary degree, like the student can choose, do I actually go in a certain occupation right away without going through an apprenticeship system, or do I enter an apprenticeship system first? Uh, and um, so uh, the training wage, the wage you get if you actually go in an apprenticeship system, uh, training system compared to going directly in the labor market and starting in the same occupation is just one third to one half of the market wage. Uh, furthermore, the trainings are at a, a training program are two to three years uh, long uh, and the end of the series of examinations. So there is quite a bit uh, of, of a cost to entering this kind of, of training. And so our hypothesis is that um, there's only an incentive to enter an apprenticeship program if um, an occupation involves some kind of task complexity. Right? If there's something you gain from actually entering an apprenticeship system, right? there must be a significant gain of going for this uh, um, uh, two to three years uh, training program um, in opposition of, of actually uh, going right away into the labor market. And uh, so if you actually... Um so the tasks are fundamentally different between the, the apprentice sector, and that's what your hypothesis is? Yeah, yeah, and so uh, so what we find here, um, if you look at... So German economists are not trained in an apprenticeship system, right? That's right, yeah. But presumably German economists are, complex, are, are trained in complex... German economists would be a... Um, um, a college occupation and um, actually we currently work on a model where it's a life cycle model where you actually decide at the beginning of the life cycle whether you go into an apprenticeship training or whether you go to university. In our, in our model essentially university is just <coughs> a more extreme version of the apprenticeship pro uh, uh, program. So the, the more complex an occupation the more you want to get so to say trained in it, right? So the more um, it actually helps to go through an educational system first. So a university degree is a, a, a more extreme version of an apprenticeship system. I'm wondering if, if what we're being trained in, in, in the apprenticeship, the apprenticeship system is something that is occupation specific in, in terms of the capital that's being accumulated, where you could have occupations that are just more general in nature than you accumulate in school. And that's the distinction. Uh, uh, well, everybody who enters the apprenticeship system already has a certain level of the schooling, right? And um, that essentially what you say is almost exactly our point, right? Actually, there is some occupation-specific component, something specific you need to learn, something complex that you, uh, that, that you need to learn that actually... Uh, so that is actually beneficial to go through an apprenticeship system. While a simple occupation... Uh, there's really not nothing occupation specific you need to, to learn. Sorry? Is it occupation specific? Is it sector <coughs> specific? Uh, in other words, there's a specificity for apprentices, but I mean, I thought there was a lot of turnover, even in Germany, among people who were apprentices in one system and <coughs> moving even across sectors, much less firms. So, um, so once you start the apprenticeship system, you, you stay in your occupation. When you leave it, you have to start uh, from the beginning, right? Oh, it's not. It's not match. It's it's match specific for an occupation, but not necessarily for a firm, right? I mean, I mean, you can have a component where you're working for BMW, and your skill yeah. is only useful at BMW. Yeah, that's right. You can imagine another component that's useful for automotive sector. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering how you could distinguish. These. Oh, uh, at this point, not at all, right? We are actually not behind that. At, uh, in this paper, we are not behind that at all. We just like want to test if. If it's true that um, uh, uh, apprentices sort more into complex occupations, this is just a very simple so that uh, a very simple task and a, ver a very simple test, a very intuitive test where we think that um, in a simple occupation there is just no return to going into an apprenticeship system because there is nothing um, complicated or nothing complex to learn. While in a complex occupation, it really pays off uh, going into a training because you learn something that's specific to that job. And that's exactly what we find here, right? So actually, if you look at, at uh, so uh, we find that um, uh, over 80% of appren uh, apprentices work in, uh, are in, uh, in island two, in a complex island, 
um, only 10% of them are a simple island. Uh, so after completion of the training, actually some of uh, those people downgrade. So um, uh, about 5% of the uh, people drop actually out of the apprenticeship system and, and go into a simple occupation. But uh, generally it's just, uh, uh, this is a simple test where um, uh, that shows that our task measure is indeed related to, um, well, investing into an educational program. Could I, could I say? Yeah, yeah, I'm actually running out of time, so um, we can discuss it. Like yeah. yeah. Couldn't you just look at years of education? Yeah, so that's what we are doing here. Okay, so then we are matching the whole thing to uh, the US data. So this is actually now from census data. Uh, and uh, now we are looking at the fraction of high school dropouts, those with a high school degree and those with a college degree in each of the islands. And uh, what we find is, um, uh, well, the, uh, the fraction of high school dropouts uh, decreases monotonically uh, in an island uh, designation, right? The higher the island, the more complex the island, the smaller is the fraction of high school dropouts. Uh, likewise, um, the more complex the occupation, uh, the larger is the, the share of, of those with a college degree. So here you already see that island three and island four, especially island four is almost entirely, almost by definition, um, uh, a, um, a, a college degree, a high, sc uh, a high skill occupation. Uh, so this shows us that actually even for the US data, our task um, designation has really captured skills in, uh, in a reasonable way. It gets us exactly what we would expect. Um, so here are just a few examples where um, uh, we um, differ from uh, um, the um, computerization and routinization uh, literature. Uh, for example, a lot of the middle skill clerical occupations, like insurance sales occupations, real estate sales occupations, <laughs> accountants and editors and so on, uh, that, uh, that require some um, uh, uh, ability to actually um, interact with customers and uh, processing information. Uh, we um, view them as uh, complex occupations via actually in uh, Otter and Dorn, uh, they are routine intensive. All these occupations here are routine occupations, but routine occupations that, that we view as complex. And likewise, um, uh, on the other uh, um, extreme, we have occupations that we view as simple, so they are island one occupations, uh, but Otter and Dorn uh, um, or the polarization literature would view them as high routine intensive. Uh, no, those are actually non-routine intensive. Yeah, they're, they're non-routine occupations. So parking lot attendants, gardeners, and groundskeeper, uh, groundskeepers, janitors, and so on. So these are really occupations that we view, I think, traditionally as low skill. Uh, um, and, but uh, Otter and Dawn view them as, as non-routine occupations, right? So here, um, this is, uh, is so we, we actually start with the simplest uh, um, uh, way of cutting the data. We first ask, um, uh, um, we first calculate the fraction of occupations above the wage growth kernel. So remember, we have this wage growth kernel at the beginning of, uh, of the presentation. And, and uh, um, we ask what the share uh, um, uh, of island one occupations is that is above um, this kernel and uh, uh, what is the share that's below the kernel. And we do this uh, separately for each island. And so here we, we see that clearly um, uh, island one is the least likely to be above the kernel, right? So island ones are the least likely to actually be, no matter where you look in the 1980 uh, wage level uh, distribution, they are li the least likely to be a high wage growth occupation. Uh, and then we are doing this a uh, bit more systematically. So here we regress um, uh, the change in uh, log hourly wages between 1980 to 2005 on our island dummy. So a, di a dummy for island one, island, uh, island two, island three, island four. So all these effects are relative to island one. Uh, in one specification, we are also including the routine intensive uh, um, uh, um, measure and uh, we are also controlling for um, the 1980 wage, right? So we basically uh, measure controlling for the wage in 1980 um, uh, are more complex occupations more likely to be high wage growth, right? And so our results are actually very strong and monotonic in the task complexity of, of an island, right? So island four, as expected, uh, has the highest um, wage growth 
uh, um, and island one has the lowest VH growth, no matter where we actually look uh, in. Rediscovering that the returns to schooling went up? Um, I mean, island four or college after finishing. I mean, it seems like your islands are almost very tightly linked to education. That's actually true for island three and island four. Yes, if it's you, not true for. If you, if you condition on schooling or something? Do yes, we do. Actually, I'll show you in the end. Um, uh, what you see is some sense exactly right for island 3 and island 4. For island 3 and island 4, we cannot f estimate any precise effect separately from education, but for island 1 and island 2, we can. Um, uh, so here, the same as actually, so here we are requesting uh, employment, the changes in employment share instead, and again, we find um, that uh, uh, the higher the task complexity, the larger is the employment growth, though here we actually get much less precision. Um, the routine intensive uh, um, measure really doesn't have any significant effect here either. And then we're doing uh, a number of robustness checks. Uh, so we are uh, estimating, so how much do we have? One minute, okay. Uh, so we are um, looking at different um, uh, parts of the 1980 wage distribution. So we are estimating at the separately at the bottom of the uh, skill distribution, the middle of the skill distribution, and top of the skill distribution as defined by the 1980 wages. Uh, and uh, we always find uh, a very robust and significant effect on the island two. Uh, it's much harder for island three and for island four because island three and island four uh, are just never actually, um, we, we don't find island three or island four occupations um, uh, at the bottom of the 1980 wage distribution. And um, uh, let me just uh, show you here, uh, this is the final regression I show you. Um, uh, so we also control for education in the following way. We sort occupations based on the largest education group share of the labor force. So group one is less than grade 12, group two is uh, grade 12, and group three uh, is college. And so you find exactly what you expect down here. Uh, the so. Um, uh, wage growth is strictly monotonic in uh, the education group dummy, uh, but actually our uh, island two dummy uh, remains highly significant, right? So in any regression we find, no matter uh, what the educational content is, complex occupations are the ones that really experienced, um, so island two occupations are the ones that experience the largest wage growth. Uh, so let me just finish up. So uh, we think that our paper brings back skills, uh, uh, brings back skills into the polarization debate because it's really not clear what non-routine and routine occupations represent, right? It's not really, really clear how they relate to skills. But I think our um, uh, task or our um, uh, uh, occupational classification really relates quite tightly to skills. Uh, and uh, we think of low-skill occupations at the, as those that involve simple tasks. They uh, predominantly draws from lower education groups. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a service or non-service occupation. This is just not the right way of looking at uh, the occupations. It's, uh, th uh, no matter if it's service or non-service, no matter the, the, the wage level in 1980, those are the biggest losers in terms of wage and employment growth. And the higher skill occupations involve uh, increasing degree of complexities. Uh, these include many middle class uh, manual occupations, right? So it's actually not true that um, uh, middle class jobs died, right? It's just that um, uh, uh, jobs that were quite highly paid in 1980, but were uh, simple. Those are the occupations that lost the most. And uh, these results are hidden when focusing on, on the kernels. Uh, and um, yeah. I think in the future, so we are working on integrating this into uh, the structural models of human capital accumulation with uh, an, an explicit educational decision. And so that finishes the presentation, yeah. Okay, thanks. So this paper addresses a major question. Obviously, it's been uh, on the minds of economies for a number of years. Well-documented polarization in employment and wages and more generally growth and inequality. I'm not citing uh, enough papers here, but I ran out of space on the slides. Basically, there's been a, a bunch of potential explanations put forward, computerization, labor force composition, education, gender, effects of international trade, more generally, skill bias, technical change, some complementarities. Uh, what this paper does is um, mostly focuses on wages and a little bit on employment. And it introduces its own taxonomy of, of occupations by complexity of tasks involved in, this, in, this, uh, in, in a given occupation. And then provides a descriptive characterization of patterns by, by this new categorization of occupations. So my plan is to 
talk a little bit about motivations and, 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 and results and then finish up with talking about how you know, we should interpret uh, uh, these results and talk about the potential mechanisms that are behind the data. So the data used to uh, sort of um, categorize the, the uh, occupations is this qualification and working conditions in Germany data. It's worker level and basically it allows uh, um, to classify occupations into different complexity bins. Then there's a map to US occupations. So I'm going to take a US occupation and match it with some German occupation that is kind of similar. And so then we'll end up with US occupations sitting in, in each complexity bin. And then the idea is to compare it to uh, outer and door uh, routine task intensity index. So I have se sort of several questions that deal with motivation and some of the results. Some of these issues have been raised in questions sort of during the talk. My first question that I think uh, uh, the authors could do a better job of motivating is why should we use German data to do this? Uh, so I, I was going to propose maybe looking at this ONET data that contains pretty detailed uh, task content of occupation. So I, I'm just going to give you an example of an ability that is used at different tasks. Fluency of ideas. This is the ability to come up with a number of different ideas about a topic, independent of quality. Um, and then you know you could look at truck drivers and aerospace engineers. Uh, truck dr drivers think uh, that the weight uh, for this particular occupation of disability is much lower than aerospace engineer. This is very intuitive. We could look at other skills or tasks. So for example, let's look at operations and control. So controlling operations of equipment of systems. Um, truck drivers, uh, uh, for truck drivers, this classification assigns a lot of weight and a lot of importance of that, that particular skill in that job. This is also intuitive. For aerospace engineers, they do it sometimes, uh, but it's not very important. So sort of the importance is pretty low. Um, last uh, example, abilities, manual dexterity. So this could be, uh, um, this is the ability to quickly move your hand, your hand together with your arm, or both hands to manipulate or assemble objects. So, you know, naturally, truck drivers, this is almost as close as you can get to a description of what the truck driver does. Uh, it's very important, less so for aerospace engineers. So I guess, you know, at least my take is it's, it's detailed enough that you could actually use it to classify the complexity of a task. Um, it is occupation level, so it's not worker level data. But on the other hand, the analysis in the paper is on occupation level anyway. So I'm not sure that we're losing that much there. On the other hand, we're introducing a little bit of noise, or I don't know how much noise, by doing the transition from German data and the map between German workers' occupations and US workers' occupations. So the question is, are German occupations and workers similar enough to the US counterparts for us to be confident in this map? I don't know. So I guess the, the, the benefit of the German data is we have this apprenticeship informa uh, information and uh, Florian talked about it uh, quite a bit. The question is, is it worth it to pay the price of introducing the noise in the data? I don't know. So I'm not sure we have the data to answer this question. And I'm not sure we should, as a first pass, be trying to answer this question uh, and not running with the, with the US counterpart. So that's my first question. My second question is, Kind of why this comparison uh, with, the, with the routine task intensity index? Why not go back to something more primitive, the raw data, or maybe uh, another paper by author and co-authors, which has four classes of, uh, of tasks involved in occupation, routine versus non-routine, combined with manual and information processing. So then we have four categorization. How would you do this? You know, a truck driver would be non-routine manual. Jobs involving forming and testing hypotheses like an economist or a, a, an aerospace engineer would be non-routine information processing. So again, this is, if you want to talk about skills, this seems like a more natural classification. So the, the outer and down measure is U-shaped by design. It puts a, it's positive wherever you have a routine task and it's negative wherever you have a manual task or, a, or a, an abstract task just because of the questions that they want to, to ask. But if you want to talk about skills involved in or complexity of a job, this seems like a more natural alternative. So uh, the paper actually uses almost identical classification, but using the German data, routine, manual, non-routine, cognitive, interactive. So 
it seems like a, a, a more natural match. So I think um, this should be uh, kind of addressed uh, more in detail in the paper. And this last one is, are we selecting on worker characteristics? So we know there's been gro growth in the college premium, growth in payment shares to college female intensive jobs. Are we selecting occupations with growing importance of education or interpersonal relations or any type of skill that is related to these uh, two trends that we know of? Uh, so selection on, on job composition changes must be a concern if you want to just identify the, the occupation uh, uh, characteristics on not the composition of workers. So bins in the paper are simple, complex, advanced or college. So are we capturing the college premium, basically? There was a question like that. I don't know. Uh, it looks like, uh, to a large extent, we are. Um, Sim super simple example. This is kind of the regression we're uh, running in the paper. The change in uh, wages of occupation O uh, between 1980 and 2005 based on these complexity bands and some initial conditions. So suppose that we have some labor group L. It could be any combination of gender, age, education, whatever you want. Um, then the change in the wages of occupation O in, in for labor group, labor group L could depend on labor group fixed effects and our complexity bands and general occupation fixed effects. But maybe we want to simplify the analysis and basically do something simple. So what would we do to aggregate it up? Suppose that weight in, uh, of uh, labor group L and occupation O are these pi's. We can multiply both sides by pi's and aggregate it up. The left hand side is going to just give us the change in wage. The original object we're interested in and the right hand side is going to have this sort of weighted sum of the labor group fixed effects. So in other words, it's going to depend, the composition of a given occupation in terms of labor groups is going to matter a lot for what we find for wages. And it's going to be independent so, sort of from complexity. So, so the error we could potentially make, so the assumption we're making by not doing it is that this error is uncorrelated with whatever we put on the right hand side of the regression. Uh, you know, so there need to be independence. Um, an example of them not being independent is, is that complex occupations are female and education intensive. So then we know that this IL is going to be big for those and the weight is going to be big. So if, if weights are correlated with our selections, we're going to have a problem. So one solution is to basically run a minster type regression uh, or something like uh, Archemoglu and Autor that basically includes these uh, labor group fixed effects. So, so I guess the question I want to ask is do the results survive controlling for these characteristics? Uh, the, the paper doesn't do it, but it gives some idea. So if we control for education groups, which is not controlling for worker level characteristics, but just uh, sort of the average uh, education within a group, island three and four disappear. Florian talked about it, this is not a secret. We still have some effects in Island 2, um, so there may, this may be a paper about that. Um, but the question is, what happens if we actually do it? And what if we control for age and gender, too? Uh, or any type of observables that we do see in the US data. Lastly, so suppose we estimate this regression. Um, I just want to step back and try to think about how we should interpret these, uh, these uh, findings. So changes in all of these objects that we see are functions of equilibrium responses of the economy to something. Um, it may be computerization, it may be something else. Um, it's a descriptive analysis and it's great, but in, in some sense to take a stand on the role of shocks or fundamental sort of primitives in driving these responses, we need to put more structure on it. So I, I guess what I'm asking for is a model and then we can evaluate potential policies. It is going to, any shock will work through the economy and affect all of these objects. So it's uh, not, not uh, possible from this simple regression to actually draw conclusions. So uh, I, one example that is, I think is very nice is a paper by Burstein, Morales and Vogel that basically provide a micro foundations for, uh, for this uh, regression equation. And, and basically then use a, a general equilibrium model to basically decompose the role of shocks for, uh, for wage growth. Um, they, they do it for employment and, and have an extension for, uh, for wages. So let me wrap up. Um, 
the paper studies wage inequality from the perspective of occupation complexity, that's the new measure, it's not clear to me how much is due to your occupation characteristics or are we just renaming sort of uh, different premia that have already been found in the literature so that I think more work needs to be done there. What about employment? So the results are much weaker for employment. So it, to me at least, it's, it's without a model, it's hard for me to put it in the supply demand framework and try to, um, of, of different labor groups, and try to understand what the results really mean. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for these great comments. They're very helpful. And um, uh, so yeah, I agree that actually using the ONET as a robust check is, is important. Uh, so the reason why we haven't done it is um, it's new. It's fairly new, right? So we are looking at uh, the um, period 1982, 2005. And so um, uh, the ONET actually starts um, in the 2000s. Uh, and um, also, uh, we think that uh, that our um, that pure fact that our island designation or island classification can predict wage growth very strongly, or um, and is highly uh, associated with various skill measures in the U.S. data, is um, uh, you know incorporates the quality of our uh, uh, occupational qualification and that it, that it works uh, for the US data and not only for the German data, right? If it's really, if you had only noise, if, if uh, matching those uh, German, uh, that this information that's obtained from the German data to US data and the match is really bad, uh, I don't think we would find this robust, and, and they are really robust um, effects on, on wage growth and to some extent employment growth. And, um, uh, so now this is about the ONET data, but I agree that we should uh, 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 check robustness uh, using the ONET data. Uh, now about Ardor Levy and Mornane. Um, well, Ardor and Dawn is just an aggregation of Ardor Levy and Mornane, and it turns out that um, if you use Ardor um, uh, Levy and Mornane, it really doesn't change the results. This is, um, and, but uh, what you said is, um, we also classify uh, tasks by routine manual versus non-routine manual, routine cognitive versus non-routine cognitive. That's right. But each of these bins or each of these broad classes of tasks, what they mean is different in uh, Arthur Levy and Mornane and in our uh, uh, occupational classification. In uh, Arthur Levy and Mornane, for example, um, uh, routine manual would be finger dexterity, uh, non-routine manual would be um, uh, uh, hand-eye coordination, but uh, in our measure actually um, uh, we define uh, non-routine as anybody who does some kind of production of, of something that involves <coughs> skills like um, car mechanics or carpenters, um, raised and operatives. And so, on. so um, and finally, yeah, you are asking for a decomposition. So, yeah, disaggregating the data to a final level, we can do that. We haven't done that yet. But so, there is a paper by Pierre Paul Fortin and Lemieux who do a decomposition uh, exercise into how important is age and gender uh, uh, for predicting certain occupational uh, uh, outcomes. And we could do something like that too by disaggregating our data to the occupation, education, gender, age level, essentially. So. Yeah, we haven't done that yet. Okay. Maybe can we just have to add that <coughs> it's yeah. a very well taken point that, um, of course, we would like to have a model uh, where you could understand all the changes. I mean, and understand probably all the aspects of the data that we showed. And in some sense, uh, for us, actually, the first uh, thing that uh, we, have, we want to think about is understanding the cross-section in 1980. Why does the cross-section in 1980 look like that? I mean, why do you have complex, what we call complex occupations that get paid low wages, and why you have simple occupations that are in the middle of the distribution. So, we, so and once we understand the cross-section in 1980, then, uh, then one can then say, okay, let's understand the changes from 1980 to 2005, and I think that uh, will be much easier, because we have a very good understanding of uh, why the cross-section looks like that. And uh, maybe just one more thing. So, employment, uh, it's true, we, uh, right, we put only, uh, in, a, in the version that we have, we put less, uh, but uh, we have uh, more results. And I'm not sure they're weaker in the sense that uh, the coefficients look small, 
but actually these are big changes in employment. Even though the competitions are kind of small, I mean, if you have a 0.05% change in, in, in our occupation, it's, it's, it's fairly big. I was wondering how you think about, so you seem to sort of start off talking about occupations and it's really about what skills workers have and you know whether it's a routine job or, or a non-routine job, what matters is the pool of workers they're drawing on, which, which makes sense to me in, in, in many ways. But then I get, so I guess I wonder what, you, what it means to say some occupations' wages are going up a lot and others aren't. If, you know, in equilibrium, and presumably if they're hiring the same worker, they should, wages should be moving together. So the question is, is what you see in these occupations a major change <coughs> in the skill level of workers? And I don't know whether people have been looking at that, but you see in these occupations that, that kind of go to, go, that don't have any wage growth relative to, to those that do, that the, the education level of the workers in those occupations has gone down dramatically? Because I was trying to think about it first, yeah, maybe you do want to control for education and individuals, but, but maybe maybe you don't in some sense because maybe that's where all the action is. If, if, if they've got to compete uh, for workers and some jobs became, you know, got, got routinized or got taken over, well, they can't pay the same workers crappy wages if everybody else is paying high wages, so they got to get crappier workers that because they don't really need good workers anymore. Is that what we're, should I think about it that way? Or I, I guess <coughs> this, this, this difference between skills and tasks seems to get lost in this discussion. I'm not quite sure it's clear in my head either. But, uh, I mean, one way to think of it is that suppose that uh, there was a technical change bias, but complex task uh, technical change bias. So that will basically give you this result that occupations, uh, in which uh, which are complex in the sense that using these complex tasks, just wages went up there. Now, of course, this condition on all other things that you mentioned that could have been going on, the kinds of workers that happen. But if they're bidding for the same group of workers as less complex tasks, don't they drive up the wages in, in, in these other sectors as well? But, uh, but that I'm not sure if they, if, they, if they take from the same set of workers, uh, if they're exactly the same, because uh, one, one, I mean, of course, that already would have to be within the framework of a model, but imagine that people have kind of uh, different ability and different uh, level of uh, tax com task complexity or skill complexity they can get, either through, I mean, the extreme is you go to college, but less extreme, some of the vocational training occupations. Uh, so, I don't think that, uh, so uh, it's not obvious that they're, they're taking from the same pool of workers with the same underlying skills. In the end, yeah, there could be some sorting based on the underlying distribution of workers across these skills. Yeah, they, based on the change, there could be some sorting that could have some effect, but as a first order of uh, approximation, uh, just a simple complex skill bias technical change would uh, just uh, tell you that yes, occupations that uh, use those skills, Wages grew faster there. Will be consistent with these. So it's a different pool of workers from occupations that paid the same amount before, but weren't complex. Say something like that. Yeah. So we have. Uh, so we are working on a human capital model, right? And so actually, the pool of um, of workers who will go in the complex occupations is different from the pool of workers who go into the simple occupations because you need to have the ability to learn, right? So you essentially you have heterogeneity in learning ability. And, um, yeah, and and only people who have a certain level of learning ability will go into a complex uh, occupation, right? So um, they draw from different... Uh, but just as a matter of fact, do we know whether this educational level of workers in, across these occupations has shifted a lot? Um, so that would be consistent with this? I mean, how much of this could be explained by by sort of shifts in the quality of workers. I, I'm just curious. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, we actually have the table. We have the table, but, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I, is, that, is it a lot? We, we can look at it together. I can't answer you the question at the moment. I'm wondering what you're doing with occupations that have changed in big ways. So for example, nurses. In 1980, nurses had a lot of tasks. Some of them were really menial. And now there are uh, LPNs and nursing assistants, are those all aggregated together? 
nursing assistants versus nurses. Yeah. Uh, let me think in the occupation classification. Uh, you have um, licensed nurses versus um, nursing assistants. Yes, you do. So and, LPNs and are part of nurses. The one would be complex and the other one would be simple. But still LPNs are part of Sorry? nurses. Sorry? Lic licensed practical nurses are nurses also, are the same as RNs, registered nurses. I mean. Licensed nurses versus nursing assistant code. Yeah, licensed nurses versus nursing assistants. Well, more generally, what I'm worried about is that within an occupation, there's a lot of variation. So, some of the sub occupations are in one group and some are in another, and maybe that changes over time as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, um, uh, we are holding the task content. Constant, right? Um, right for nurses, that's yeah. really okay, uh, so. be very. Bad. So nurses actually, uh, in our case, uh, actually both in Otter and Dorn, and <coughs> nurses are, um, but in Otter and Dorn they are non-routine in our classification. It's, it's a complex occupation, but we hold that constant over time. Nurses were actually only paid in 1980 and had a very large wage growth, right? But the, the, so the point we are making is that the distinction between non-routine and routine is not very informative. What really right. matters, I, yeah, I matters is, um, yeah. The task content is the bit, and the bit is quite constant from 79 to 92. So, so over the time range we have in the task data, it's, probably speaking, the yeah, designation is quite stable. 